QE for property investors is really important. But when QE is at record levels that have never been seen before, and the approach has very discreetly been changed by the government, it's so important that you understand this because it's going to impact you, all your investments, and your future wealth or lack of it if you don't understand it. It's that important. So what is QE? Okay, so QE is carried out by the Bank of England. And so we need to start by understanding what the Bank of England are actually trying to do. So their job, as given to them by government, is to produce inflation of about 2% per year. And it does that by controlling the money supply. The greater the supply of money, the theory goes, the more prices go up. And this is a basic supply and demand mechanism. Now, the Bank of England doesn't actually produce the money directly for the most part. It encourages banks to make loans, and it's these loans that increase the amount of money in the economy. It does this by setting the base rate that banks can borrow at. And the lower the base rate, the cheaper it is for banks to lend. Cheaper loans, of course, mean that more people are going to want to take out loans. So the Bank of England can, by a very indirect route, manipulate the amount of demand there is for money by setting the price of money. Now, all this is working very well until the 2008 financial crash. As a result of that crash, the economy contracted. The Bank of England cut the base rate from around 5%, where it was before, all the way down to 0.5% to try to get the economy going again. But still, it didn't create enough inflation because... Nobody wanted to borrow, and the banks didn't really want to lend because they just experienced so many of their loans defaulting. So this interest rate mechanism that had worked in the past suddenly didn't work anymore. So it was time for a new tool, and that tool was QE. But it really is as simple as money being created and government bonds being purchased. So how much of this purchasing has been going on? Well, quite a bit. So in late 2008, we had financial Armageddon. So in 2009, the Bank of England created 200 billion to purchase government bonds. So in 2012, the Bank of England engaged in quantitative easing again, and at this time for 175 billion pounds. So it went quiet then for a few years. But then in 2016, Brexit was announced. And again, that created some uncertainty. So the Bank of England was quick to act and did another round of QE, this time to 70 billion. And that brings us all the way up to 2020. In 2020, it was just taken to a whole nother level. And in this round of QE, it was 450 billion pounds. Not in total, that was just 2020 which is more than all the other previous rounds of QE added up together. So we've got some big numbers and we've got a seemingly quite arcane mechanism with bonds being bought by the Bank of England. What does it all mean? What are the effects of QE? So first of all, the money supply has increased. That was the whole point of the exercise. Remember, the Bank of England just created the money to buy the bond out of nothing, effectively just typed it into a spreadsheet somewhere, and suddenly this money comes into existence. So previously, you had a bond, now you've got the money and the bond. So there's more money in the economy than there was before. This should produce inflation, because that is the stated point of the exercise. The second effect is that the price of government bonds rises, and therefore the yields on those bonds falls. That is simple supply and demand. A side effect of this is that it becomes cheaper for the government to borrow. That's because yields are now lower. And the fourth effect, which really is the big one for our purposes, is that the price of other assets rises. That happens for a couple of reasons. Firstly, all the institutions who previously owned the bonds, which they sold to the Bank of England, now have got cash instead, and they need to deploy that cash to buy something, and that applies upward pressure to asset prices. The other reason is that the price of other assets is to a large extent determined by the yields on government bonds. And if you look, Rob, at what's happened to asset prices since 2009, when QE started, you can really see this playing out. Yes, and it's important to remember that QE and the effects of it on instant. So since 2009, the FTSE all share market has almost doubled. House prices are up 63%, gilts are up 80%, but the point is that generally asset classes across the board all experienced really strong growth. But what's interesting is when you look at consumer prices, that's just gone up by 37%, which equates to 2.9% each year. So actually, while lots of people say QE will create inflation, actually, in reality, it hasn't. But for now, all we need to know is that previous rounds of QE have caused asset prices to go up, consumer prices to grow in line close to expectations, and the 450 billion hasn't touched any of this so far. So besides it being a record amount of money created, what else is different about QE in 2020? Well, this is where things get really interesting. 
because there's this point you just made, Rob, of why has there been asset price inflation, but not consumer price inflation? And the answer to that is likely to be in terms of where the money went. So because the new money that was created ended up going to financial institutions, those financial institutions then went out and bought assets and therefore asset prices have inflated. But that money hasn't had much contact with the real economy. That's why consumer prices aren't up by anything like as much. However, the mechanism for QE in 2020 is subtly different. So it all comes down to what the government is doing in terms of its spending while this QE is going on. So if we go back and look at the 200 billion of QE in 2009, the first time this happened, then we'll go to 2012, which is where there was another round of QE, this time 175 billion. So this money was being created, but this money wasn't being used to fund government spending. It was going elsewhere. However, in 2020, we had the pandemic. The government suddenly needed to find a lot of money to pay for furlough, the job retention scheme, loans to businesses, more spending on health, benefits increases, all that kind of thing. It suddenly had this extra funding need. And this extra funding need in 2020 was £485 billion. That is the amount of new government bonds that they issued. QE in 2020 was £450 billion. So the amount of debt that the UK government issued is almost exactly matched by the amount of bonds that the Bank of England bought. So it's a subtle difference, but it's an important one. In its simplest form for you to understand this, and it may not technically be correct, but in its simplest form, the government's just created 450 billion to spend on itself. But not itself really, on you. Because this money has been spent on furlough, job retention schemes, loans, more health spending, benefits increases, universal credit, for example, the temporary rise there, there's loads. They've been spending this money. And this is very different to what's gone before. And this was kind of the complaint, and understandably so, of QE in the past. But here it's far more direct to the end consumer. So it's easy to see now how this time around, it could create inflation across the board. So we've had record levels of QE, more than everything else put together before. We've got QE that's different this time. And we've got QE that will possibly have an inflationary impact, not just on asset prices, but also on consumer goods as well. So you know what's likely to happen now, but what can you do about it? In terms of actions to take though, well, the answer is that what you should do is the same thing that we've been saying you should do for eight years now, which is to buy assets. Why? because, well, there's this extra 450 billion to feed through. The other reason is that if this new round of QE does end up in creating more inflation in consumer prices, then the value of any cash you hold is gonna be eroded. Well, people should buy assets and when possible, buy them with debt. Because if asset prices rise and inflation hits in and you're in that position, you're in a position to win. But if you've got something useful from this video, you'll get so much more from the Property Podcast, where every week we bring you what investors really need to know. You can listen anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Just search Property Podcast.